a little slow getting out of the gate this morning, so I'm just going to casually wait for a little signal from Scott that we're okay to start. Okay. Song number two, if you're using the song books. <coughs> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah from the
Will you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this Lord's Day when we can be together as a church and worship you. Father, we thank you for the songs that we sing, how great you are. Father, we thank you again for Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and all that he died for us, that through him we may have the promise of eternal life. Father, we thank you for our church and our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for our deacons and our elders that lead us in a righteous way. Father, we pray for those in our church that cannot be here for various reasons. We pray for those that are sick. We pray that you will be with them. We pray that they will return and let you help them with their health. Father, again, we want to come to you. We know that we live in a world that's fast moving, and we know that sin is there, and we know that the devil is there too. Father, we know that we're outnumbered as Christians. It seems to be more, more devilish people in this world than it is Christians. But we thank you, Father, for us to try to follow your word and do a good deed for you. Father, as life goes on, we thank that we live in a world that's moving fast, and as the older we get, we realize that the Christian is going to be the way of life and pleasing to you. We pray that we can be a, a role model for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren, and may they know that come Sunday, that we're going to be in church and that we're going to worship you. We can be a role model, Father, and we pray that our young people will follow us as we go to church and study your word. We do thank you, Father, for your word, that it shows us the right way of life, and when we follow the right way, we know there's a place in heaven for it. Father, we thank you again for your love through Jesus and for that sacrifice that he made for us that we may have eternal life. We ask that you forgive us, Father. We all sin and we pray that we will ask for forgiveness. And we know, Father, you've always forgiven us before and you will continue to do so. Forgive us, Father, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs>
and we sit around the table this morning, we might ask ourselves this morning, what part of me does Christ want? What part of my life does Christ want of me? He wants all of me. Simply said, he wants this life given to him. So gracious was he to die for our sins. You know, I'm reminded this morning of a song that we sometimes sing, and I'd like to read that song because we, several years ago, come to the realization that we needed to stop and sort of put ourselves in a state of mind where we can remember that great sacrifice to stop for a couple of moments and render that obedience to him who gave so much for us. I'm reminded of the song that we sometimes sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gains I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast Saved in the death of Christ, my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flowed mingle down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns composed, so rich a crown? Were the whole realms of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love that's so amazing and so divine that it demands my soul, my life, and my all. What does it demand this morning from me and you? Our life and our all. Because this is one that gave his life and his all for us. I also would like to read this morning to put us in memory of that sacrifice from the book of Mark, the 15th chapter, talking about that great sacrifice in Christ before Pilate. The Bible reads this way, and straightway in the morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto him, Thou say it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answer thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee? But Jesus yet answered nothing. So that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomever, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them and had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done before them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for, for envy. But the chief priests moved the people, that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do with him? whom ye shall call the king of the Jews. And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, What? What evil hath he done? And they cried out more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him 
to be crucified. This is a Savior that had no sin. This is a Savior that lived a perfect life. This is a Savior that gave his all for you and for I. And this is a Savior that we will see again if we do those things that are written upon the pages of inspiration. So if we, as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, let us never forget that great sacrifice. As we go through our week this week, and if we live our daily lives, let us never forget that sacrifice. I'd ask the men to come forward. Shall we pray? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Father, once again we come before you thanking you for the blessing that we all know. Your Son was given for us on the cruel cross of Calvary so we might have remission of our sins. Father, we thank you for this. We thank him for giving his life for us. Father, be with us now as we go through this, this ceremony. We thank you for this bread, which represents to us the body of Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Valid. Our Father in heaven, we continue our thanks now for this food of the vine, which to the Christian's mind represents the blood that Christ willingly gave for us. And through the shedding of that blood that we might have forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life. Be with each of us as we partake, help us to examine ourselves and partake in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we have a commandment to give. We brought nothing into this world. And it is a sure thing that we will carry nothing out. I have seen lots of noble men, gospel preachers, women that have rendered their lives to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I think about them from time to time, even as a boy growing up, I, I sometimes think about these people that have long gone. And I think about their lives. And they brought nothing into this world. And as I seen them go away, they carried nothing out. The same will go with us. We have the obedience to do what God has commanded us to do. A part of that is giving back. He's blessed us so much. We, we breathe. We can think. We have our bodies. We have clothing. We have shelter. And it's because of his goodness to us that we have this. He asked for a portion of that back. We're going to render that this morning at this time as a matter of convenience. Let us pray. Let's give thanks. Father heaven, we're indeed thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day and for this privilege and opportunity that we have as your children to assemble here today to serve and worship thee, our God and our Creator, to give thee thanks for your Son Jesus and the spiritual blessing that we enjoy through him. Father, we're also mindful of the physical blessing that you've given us, and we pray that at this time as we give back unto thee a portion of that that you blessed us with, that we'll do so in a way that not, not grudgingly, but always thankful to have the opportunity to return unto thee a portion of what you blessed us with. As we give at this time, we pray that we'll do so in a way that will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Song before the lesson this morning is number four. And if you guys would like to stand as we sing the song, feel free to do so. Blessed us.
you get your song mark, be turning your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. <coughs> I appreciate all of you being here and participating in our service. Hope it's been uplifting and beneficial to you. I want to read to you, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 12, verse 6 verses of Revelation. And I, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon, and under her feet and on her head was a crown of twelve stars. And she was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. And another sign appeared in the heavens, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept across a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth to the child so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to the son, a male child, who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled to the wilderness where she had the place prepared for God so that she might be nourished for a thousand two hundred and sixty days. This actually is a story about the birth of Jesus Christ when Jesus came into this world. But the picture is of every single woman who has given birth to a child. Because when that child is given birth, there is a great red dragon sitting at the feet of the bed. When that baby is born, that he might devour that child. That is the story of the Bible in an unfortunate sort of way, all the way from the time of the Garden of Eden till the children of Adam and Eve throughout this time today. I want to talk about raising children in difficult times. I would venture to guess that parents who raised kids 60 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago said, hey, I was trying to raise kids in pretty difficult times. And that's probably true. There had been things happen in my lifetime that seemed to me to make things a lot more difficult when it comes to raising children than we have seen in previous years or pre previous generations. There are young people here who have small children, young people here who haven't started having babies. And I hope this is some benefit to you. One of the things that happened really uh, in the World War II period of time, the 1940s, from the Great Depression up into the time of World War II, ending in 1947, would have been time that my parents were first born, or first married rather, and were having children. There was a shift where people, almost everybody, lived in the country. They lived out of town. How many of you that are my age or younger can remember every single one of your grandparents saying, well, I was raised on a farm? Anybody ever heard that before? Now, when I used to hear that, I thought, that's got to be the craziest thing in the world. How could every single grandparent that I ever met in my life be raised on a farm? That's the way it was. It simply was the way it was. People were raised on, on farms. Uh, I think about going back 60 years ago, Houston, Texas now, the greater Houston area, is about 4 million people. You know how big Houston, Texas was when I was a small child? about one-tenth that size. So there are things that have caused people to move from cities, from, from, from the farms rather, into city. And large of it was, instead of being self-employed and running, working your own farm and raising what you could and trading with other people, people went to work for companies. They went to work for major companies. That really happened in World War II and it's not gotten over it since. Now, I never completely bought in the fact that in East Texas, when my grandparents were young, that it snowed three to four feet every time. Unless we were in an ice age, somewhere around Lufkin and Huntington, Texas, I never bought that. And I never bought the fact that they had to walk to school uphill both ways. That just never made sense to me. But people were raised on a farm in that period of time. And so that shift, what happened was you had kind of a pristine environment. You had a situation where the people that your children were around were pretty well protected. You knew who they were. They were your parents, your grandparents, maybe aunts and uncles, maybe cousins, a few people that lived neighbors around here that went to a community school. In the time that we live in today, when children, by the time they're five years old and going to kindergarten, you don't really know what all they're involved with and what all they're around. 
The second thing I would tell you was the loss of the extended family. <clears throat> Over the last three generations, we have become a nation on wheels. People go to school, they go to trade school, they go to college, and then they look for the best job. And I would venture to guess, just thinking about my own time, the people that I went to high school with and folks that I haven't seen in years, how many of the people that I went to high school with still live around here? Well, it was probably half, maybe, something like that. What about the next generation and the next generation? So what happens is, I was reading an article or a book, actually, part of a book, where this gentleman was talking about families today, houses are like gas stations. You come in and you gas up and you take off and somebody else comes in and they gas up and they take off. And what he was, the point he was making was, we have lost the kitchen table, the dining room table, the place where people ate together and had conversations. I find it interesting that there's a couple of our favorite shows, one of them is called Blue Bloods, uh, where this fellow is the police commissioner, Tom Selleck. Every single show, they end with them all sitting around the dinner table talking. I would say the show Duck Dynasty was like that, wasn't it? Do you think that has largely been lost in our day and time? Where the family has come, where you have a family conference. And the children talk about what's going on, and the older children talk about it, and the parents talk. We've lost that. Industrialization in a time where during the war, where you had close to a million young men pulled out of farms and just all kinds of places and carried to Germany and Japan and all kinds of places. And there was a tremendous need for building tanks and jeeps and sewing clothes. Who do you think did that? The women did it. The women did it. So basically what happened was you had an increase of, of women working outside of the home increased by thousands of percent. When my, when my parents were young, do you know by and large that never changed? Today, almost 80% of mothers are employed outside the home. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, when Timothy talks about a, a woman who was a widow indeed, and that is a woman who had no, they had, she had no Christian children or grandchildren. The church could take care of them. But if a woman was young, Peter, uh, Timothy said, don't put her, on, or Paul told Timothy, don't put her on the list because she's going to want to get married again in time, and so she's not going to be a widow indeed forever. Now that's the context. But I want you to look in verse 11, 1 Timothy 5, 11. Refuse to put younger widows on the list for they feel sensual desires and disregard of Christ that want to get married, thus incurring condemnation. That is, they made a pledge to God. I'm going to be married to God. I'm going to be married to the church. And because of that, I'm going to draw a salary from it. And then they change their minds. At the same time, they learn to be idle. They go around house to house, not merely idle, but gossips, busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. I didn't say that. Paul did it. Therefore, I want younger women to get married, to bear children, to keep house, and to give the enemy a no occasion for reproach, for some have already turned aside to follow Satan. In Titus chapter 2, when the Apostle Paul talked to this other young preacher, he says this in Titus chapter 2 and verse 3. In Titus 2 and 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossip, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. Now, when, when, when women went into the workforce in mass quantities and did not come back after two or three generations, what took the place of the person that ran a small business? Running a small business means keeping house, raising children in a godly way. My experience has been having children now and almost a grown grandchild, you get one chance in getting this right. Now what I would say to you is this. When I was uh, many years ago, I just saw a, a longtime friend of mine, Brother Pat Jones, 
Pat was doing a meeting up in um, at um, New Caney, and I went had dinner with him on Thursday evening and visited. He, uh, we are the same age, almost exactly the same age, and I knew him from the time he was a kid when his father, W.R., preached in Lake Jackson, Texas. I had W.R. and his mother, Pat, come, um, uh, brother and sister Jones, I should say, uh, come do a series in Angleton some years ago. And what we did was we had uh, W.R. talk to the young men, and we had Gene Jones, is what I meant to say, his wife is Pat, brother and sister Gene Jones, uh, preached and taught basically a class for the women in one of the classrooms. And then W.R. would preach a lesson. It was two hours, and we did it for five nights. So I started after that because we had, at that time we had a tremendous growth in the congregation. We had lots and lots of young people. I'm talking about 30, 35 year olds. We had at one time almost 40 children in the Bible class program. So I got to asking you know, these young ladies, and one of them was kin to me, what did you think about the, the series of lessons that Sister Jones did and Brother Jones did and the sermons? What I got about 75% of the respondents was, Rick, they're so out of touch. They're so out of touch with reality, they don't have a clue. Now, W.R. and Gene were probably 70 at the time. And they said they just don't have a clue about having time to sit down and have dinner around the table and have Bible study and read to the kids at night and pray with them before they go to bed. So I think back now, because the ladies that I'm talking about are now 55, 58, I'm going to say 50 to 60. And how many of them are their families ripped asunder? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. You see, what happened was nothing replaced that. So, so you have people who came from a generation or two before you saying, these are things you have to have. Because the devil is standing there when your child is born waiting to devour that child. And you either have to fight the devil or you're not going to fight him. And what I would tell you is, okay, I understand times have changed. The question is, what have you done, those of you that are parents and grandparents right now, what are you doing to replace that? I talked about my generation uh, when I was in college, how much change there was. And, and it absolutely, I, I just think about these people that were involved in this when I was in college. Well, these are your current Supreme Court justices and presidents and congressmen. I want you to think back. When I was young, growing up, <clears throat> I'm going to say in the 1960s, late 1950s, 1960s, the television programs that were on. How many of you remember the show Father Knows Best? You're showing your age. What about Leave It to Beaver? Now I can show you about 50 more. And in every single one of those cases, what you saw was you saw a normal family. You saw a normal family, right? You saw the dad, you saw the mom, you saw the kid. And let me tell you something that was amazing. What was amazing was, who was the head of the house on all of the TV shows in the 1950s, 1940s, 50s, and 60s? Who was the head of the house? The father. Who was the stabilizing factor in the family? The father. By the next generation or two, you had shows like The Cosby Show and Home Improvement. Now, there was a family. In every single case, it was a normal family. Let me tell you what, what changed. What changed was... Who was the dumbest person in the family? The father. The father. The three-year-old child would have to correct the father on a regular basis or the five-year-old because the dumbest person in the family who couldn't hardly put on his own clothes was the father. From that period of time on, you had one family after another, another show, and you saw the most dysfunctional things, and people would say, well, that is a reflection of our country. And they were right. They were certainly right in California, where the, in New York, where these the shows were being produced. The guy named Norman Lear, People for the American Way, you can study that. 
There were several or incredibly liberal organizations that had the right to look at every single manuscript before it was put out on a weekly basis. Now what you see was changes. I can remember uh, not too many years ago where when a young couple, like in with Linda in my case, the first house we had was a trailer house that we bought used from my sister and brother-in-law. The first house we bought was 900 square feet. 900 square feet, and we already had a child at that time. You remember a generation or so later where by the time a young couple's 25, they need every single thing their mom and daddy had? They got to have a house the size of their parents, and they got to have two new cars, and they got to do this, and they got to do it, and somebody's got to pay for that. So what happens is this. When you take a look at the families of old in the time of Noah, <laughs> So in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, God looked at the world and he saw every intent of the world was only evil continually. And he decided, I'm sorry that I made man. But then the text says, this is verse 9, when God looked at Noah, he said he was a blameless man above reproach. Now here's an amazing thing. How many of his children did he save on the ark? All of them. Oh. And here's what I hear. Well, you don't know how bad the world is, Brother Rich. You just don't know how bad the You don't know how much bad stuff. Is there any chance that the world that you live in today is as bad as the time that Noah and his wife raised their children? Not a chance. There was a time <clears throat> a man named Amram and Jochebed had three children. The first child was named Mary. She was 12 years older than their baby. Then they had a boy named Aaron. And then they had a little boy, his name was Moses. I want you to look with me at that story for just a moment. This would be in Exodus chapter 1, uh, Exodus chapter 2. I want to talk for just a moment about that story and what we learned from that story. You see, by the time Moses came along, for a number of reasons, one of the pharaohs had made the decision that every baby boy would be put to death. They were afraid of this massive multitude of Hebrew children, and they were outgrowing. They were more Hebrew children than there were Egyptians, and they were worried about them. So they decided what we needed to do was start massacring the, the baby boys. Now, that didn't happen in the time of Aaron. But by the time Moses was born, it, it, happened, it was taking place. Look at Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. Exodus 1 and 15, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. One of them's name was the Shipra, the other was named Pua. And he said, when you are helping these Hebrew women give birth and you see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. If it is a daughter, she shall live. So this is he, this is Exodus 1:17. But the midwives feared God and did not do did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. And the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women; they are vigorous and they give birth in, uh, before the midwives can get there. Now I want to stop for a minute. Would you agree with me that these midwives, two women, these were not their children, but it was a cultural thing. I want to talk about it for just a second. They were in open defiance to the king, the Egyptian king, who was perfectly willing to slaughter innocent babies. Do you have any doubt that he would have slaughtered these two women? But it didn't matter, you see, because they feared God more than they feared the king. <clears throat> So uh, because of that, in verse 20, God gave uh, was good to the midwives and the people multiplied and became very mighty. And it came about the midwives, because they feared God, he established households for them. In chapter 2 now, you have the story that uh, Moses is born and they keep him in the house for several months, but he's getting to where he makes too much noise and they decide they have to do something. So they build this little wicker basket and they put this little baby boy in it. You know the story. So here is the daughter of Pharaoh comes out and sees this child and she decides to take it. 
And it just so happens that his 12-year-old sister, Miriam, was there saying, hey, 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 I, I see you've got a baby there. Uh, would you like someone to raise that baby? And who ended up raising that child? His own mother and his sister. I want you to look at a text. Uh, this is in Exodus chapter 3, uh, 2, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 2 and verse 8. Exodus 2 and 8. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, for I shall give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew up and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. Now it's interesting. I'm not going to take the time to read this, but Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 through 27 it says that Moses, when he grew up, would choose rather to suffer the affliction of the children of Israel than the passing pleasures of sin for a season. Do you think that Moses was actually ever Pharaoh's grandson? Mentally. Now, he lived in the house 40 years, but who raised him up? His mother did. Now, how in the world... With that kind of money and that kind of power and that kind of traffic, what in the world did that woman do to raise up a boy that when he became an adult, he could live any way he wanted to live. He could have lived in the palace the rest of his life. But he chose not to do that. If you look a little bit further, the story of Hannah, <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 3, where she prayed and prayed and prayed. Do you remember the story that she was speaking one time and Eli, the high priest, looked and thought she was drunk. And she, he went up to her and said, what, uh, what are you drinking for? <coughs> and she said, no, I'm just troubled in spirit because I want a child. She made the decision that when this baby was weaned at three years of age, she would take him to Eli and she would give him back to the Lord forever. That's what the text says in 1 Samuel. Eunice and Lois. We read in Acts chapter 16 that the Apostle Paul, when he went out on his second missionary journey, he hears about this young man that is well-loved and well-respected by everybody, and he went specifically to the areas of Lystra, Iconia, and Derba to see this young man. And he finds this young man. And what we know about him in Acts 16 and 1, his mother was a believer and his father was a Greek. Now, his father's name is never mentioned. When he becomes a godly man, you can see here, when you take a look at 2 Timothy 1, 5, I met your grandmother and your mother, and I just knew what kind of person you were going to be. Philippians chapter 2, where he says there, he says, I've got nobody else like Timothy. There's no other person I've ever met who loves the Lord as much as Timothy. What is the chance that his daddy taught him how to live like that? I'm going to be, I don't know if his father was dead or alive. I have to believe that his father had zero influence in the godly person that he came, became. But who did? His mother and grandmother. Raised this boy to be different than anything the Apostle Paul had ever seen. What I'm going to talk about for just a minute is how does that happen? Is it just luck? Is it coincidence? Is it just magically happened? Does God come in, uh, as some people like to uh, believe the book of Romans teaches, and he predestines that some people are going to be good and some people are not going to be good, that some will be godly? No. What the Bible teaches us is, I have to learn how to control my environment. Now, I don't live out on a farm 20 miles out of town or 10 miles out of town like my grandparents did and my parents were raised up, but I still, I have to replace that with something. I have to be able to control my environment. I want you to look at the Revelation chapter 18. The Revelation 18, look at the text for just a moment. <clears throat> it really has to do with what does it take for me to, to control the environment of my children? And, and when my children go to school and they now have friends in different places, 
how do I build into the system? Very much like I'm going to tell you like I do when people are new converts. I want to sit down on a weekly basis for some period of time and I want to look eyeball to eyeball and I want to see what's happening in their life. I want to know where is the devil trying to attack them. And the same thing has to happen with children. In Romans chapter 18, uh, or sorry, the Revelation 18 and 4, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Come out from her, my people, that you may not participate in her sins, and you may not receive her plagues upon her. For her sins are piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay back evil as she has paid, and give back double according to her deeds. What does he say? Very much like in 2 Corinthians. Be separate. Come out from these people. There's an old saying when I was a kid that I was, it stuck with me now for 50 years or more. When you take a boat and you put the boat into the water, that's not scary because boats are supposed to be in the water. When the water gets in the boat, that's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem. You see, children are made like Christians to live in the world. That's perfectly fine. That's how God built it. But when the world gets in Christians, that's a problem. You see, each one of these texts teach the same thing. Every single one of them teach, how do I raise godly children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren? Knowing that the extended family in some cases is gone, we're blessed here to have a cases where parents and grandparents and maybe grand, great-grandparents live within a fairly small proximity. When I was a kid growing up, I had one set of parents that lived, grandparents that lived 100 miles away, and another set that lived 200 miles away. And I would spend a week with each one of them, and that was a good thing to me because I got to know them. Now let me tell you what an extended family does. It allows you to pull from multiple generations of thought. Multiple generations. Now, as a young person, you can say, oh, my granddaddy talked about the day you had to go out and crank a car like this. That tells you that they're from a different generation. Is that a bad thing? Is it always a bad thing? Is it possible that there are things that have been lost from generation to generation to generation that have brought us as a nation where we are today, meaning that the family is exploding. What maybe has happened? And I'm going to tell you a big portion of it is that we have a whole lot harder time controlling our environment today. From Facebook to Snapchat to LinkedIn to over and TV 24 hours a day and, and children having computers in their bedroom that sometimes people don't know what they're looking at and who are their friends and what are they being taught at school. Here's the second thing I want to talk about. The one thing that I see constant throughout all the New and Old Testament was this. I've got to show my kids that I love God more than I love myself or the world. Now look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, where he talks about this very thing. Well, let's just turn there and read it for a second. Matthew chapter 10. This is a passage that you're familiar with, the few verses right after this. But in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 beginning. Matthew 10, 32. Everyone that confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father, him before my Father in heaven. This word is not the same word as uh, Romans chapter 10. It means how you live your life. It means your walk, your manner of life. If I'm not ashamed to tell people I'm a Christian and that, uh, as Brother Manus prayed, that my kids and grandkids know where I'm going to be on Sunday morning and Sunday night. Now, that is a form of confessing Jesus Christ before the world. Verse 33, whoever shall deny me before men, I'll deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. In verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me 
is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his own cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. In Proverbs chapter 30, beautiful passage. Because of time, I'm not going to read this. But I want to just make this point with you. A number of studies have been done. I've got, I have a, a file of studies on this subject that have gone back over a hundred years. And let me tell you something that's pretty powerful. When you ask a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old child what God looks like, or what God is like, do you know what the overwhelming response is? They are going to describe either their father or a grandfather. Let that soak in for a minute. So for a two-year-old child, or a three- or four-year-old child, when, when they're studying about God, who are they actually picturing? A father or a grandfather? Now that's either good or bad, isn't it? If I had proven to my children that not I go to church, but rather that I love God more than I love the world. I'm going to tell you, we're going to study this next Lord's Day morning. We touched on it. In, in Jeremiah chapter 7, they believed that, that uh, Jeremiah was a nutcase because he said God's going to destroy this place. And they said, what are you talking about? we got the temple here. And we go to the temple every, first, every week. God destroyed them and the temple. You know why? Because it's very much what Brother Ashley said. What he said was, how much of us does God want? All of us. Oh, I'll give him a little bit here. I'll put in a little bit of time. I'll find some crippled, sick animal, and I'll slaughter that animal, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it to him. In the book of Malachi, he said, would you give your governor that? Going to church is not enough. It's just not enough. Especially, especially when your kids get old enough and they realize how you live at home is not how you look in the church house. And especially if you're re-preaching the preacher's sermons and the Bible class teacher's sermon because you don't believe half of what's being taught. Now, did you prove to your children that you love God more than you love yourself or more than you love the world? Look a little bit further. <clears throat> These are passages, our time is, uh, is rapidly getting away from it. These are passages that deal with how you discipline, <coughs> how you wisely discipline. The word punishment means discipline didn't work. Anybody know what the root word of discipline is? Disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is someone who is taught. He's trained by someone. Discipline is designed to teach people. I had a conversation uh, Christmas a year ago with a young lady who's part of our family. And we were talking about, Shelby and I were talking about spanking children or punish, spanking children, basically. And this young lady said, we just never could do that. We, we just never really felt like we could spank our children. And I'm thinking, uh, I would guess that. I watch you kids now. I watch you 14-year-old. I know what he looks like. I would have guessed that he's never really been disciplined in his life. So then we throw it to the school system, and then we throw it through, through the local police department, and the penal system to discipline our children because we didn't do it. Many passages on that. I'm happy to give this to you if you would like to look at it. When in Ephesians chapter 6, where the Apostle Paul says that you need to raise your kids in the nurturing and in the admonition of the Lord. What these passages teach, Deuteronomy 6, talks about, I'm going to read to my children and tell them about God when they lay down at night. 
and when they get up in the morning, in the morning and when I walk with them, and I'm going to live it in front of them, and what I want is, I want me to be a mirror of what they read in the Scripture and what they hear the preacher say and what their Bible class preacher, teacher says. If that doesn't happen, there is confusion in a child's mind like you can't imagine. The one thing that made God so sad in Genesis chapter 3, I want you to look at this for a moment. I must convince my kids, convince them that I love them more than the world loves them. Think about what we were studying this morning in the book of Jeremiah chapter 3, where God says, what injustice did your parents and grandparents find in me? What was it about how I raised them that they thought was bad or wrong? And so they turned to emptiness, uh, he said, and they became empty. When you take a look at the story of the first sin in the Bible, I want you to think about this. God built, he built Adam and Eve, and he put them in a perfect environment, and he gave them everything. And there was a time that they decided that the devil cared more about them than God cared about them. That the devil was smarter than God and that the devil was looking out for their best interests more than God was. Was that true? But at the time, they came to believe that. How do I convince my children that... Uh, <coughs> And I'm going to tell you, as a preacher, I feel that way about all kids. How do you convince them that you love them more than God? And that you love them more than the devil? That you and God are looking out for what's right, and you and God are on the same page. For every child born, the devil's sitting there. Seeking whom he may devour. How do you prove that? How did the people that, just a few that I gave you examples of, Noah, the story of Amram and Jochebed, the story of, of Lois and Eunice, the story of, of um, Hannah, how did they do that? Let me tell you why. This, this is even a sprinkling of all of the godly parents that raised children. I picked specific stories based on what I hear all the time. Oh, you don't know how hard it is, how many ungodly people are out there. You don't know this. And so I handpick stories that you need to think about and say, how did they do it? If you haven't seen this poem, I'll give you a copy of it. Mary had a little boy. His snow was white as snow. <clears throat> he never went to Bible class because Mary wouldn't go. He never heard the tales of Christ that thrilled the childish mind. While other children, children went to class, this child was left behind. As he grew from babe to youth, she saw to her dismay. <clears throat> a soul that once was snowy white became a dingy gray. You start seeing that in kids sometimes when they're six, seven years old, eight years old. You start seeing it happen. People in... Uh, Christian teachers see it happen in front of their eyes. Realizing he was lost, she tried to win him back, but now a soul that once was white had turned to dirty black. She started back to church and Bible study too. She begged the preacher, isn't there anything you can do? And so another soul is lost that once was white as snow. Bible study would have helped, but Mary wouldn't go. I was having a conversation with the a preacher friend of mine, Charles Willis, his mom and dad were good friends of mine, and he's the preacher in New Caney. And uh, they, that's a group of about 110, 120 people. And on the Thursday night that I was there, they had 52 people at a gospel meeting. And over 20 of those were visitors like me. So Charles and I are talking about how frustrating it is that 25 to 30 percent 
of their congregation had been attending the evening services. And he says to me, we're thinking about just shutting down gospel meetings because they're too depressing. Is that a good thing? And he's one of the elders as well, one of the two elders. What I would say to you is this. When people say, I'm just too busy. I'm too busy to go to Bible class. I, I can't make the Wednesday evening Bible class. That flies in the face of everything that I'm talking about. And I would say to you, it's very difficult to prove to your kids that you love them more than the devil. And that you put the Lord first when they see a thousand things that get in your way. The lesson is yours. We have a song this morning that Brother Jason is going to lead us in. That will be our song of encouragement. Number 332, I Surrender All. That's what we've been talking about. It's what we've talked about in our prayers today. And we talked about it in our Bible class. About telling the Lord, I'm going to give you everything. And in return, what I hope is my children learn that I love them more than the devil. And that, God, you love them more than the devil. If you need to be baptized to have your former sins taken away, I encourage you to make that decision today. If we can help you in any way, let this song encourage you while we're standing together and singing. I've got number 331 on the board. Oh, 331. We'll go with 331. All right. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Because of events in their life and events around us, they just made the decision to come back and dedicate their life to the Lord. If you've got kids and grandkids and great-grandkids that are still alive and you're still alive, you've still got work to do. Keep that in mind. 
So we'll have a special service this evening that Brother Ashley will lead, and I think you have that information. Come back and be with us. Shall we pray? Dear God, our Father in heaven, we praise and honor and glorify you for your goodness and mercy, your loving kindness, your generosity to us, and especially, dear God, for the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. We pray that you continue to bless us with love and happiness, with good health, and we pray that you give us understanding and wisdom of your holy will that we might live lives that would indeed glorify you. As we dismiss now, Lord, we pray that you'd go with us and be in our hearts and our minds and guide us through this life that we might be influences to others to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.